Harold Berenger from Duke University. Uh, Professor Berenger received his PhD uh, from Cornell University in 1986. Uh, after his PhD, he did a postdoc in France at Orsay and then uh, moved on to work for Bell Labs until 1999, uh, after which he became a professor at Duke University. Professor Berenger is a fellow of the American Physical Society, an award he received for his influential work on quantum systems at the mesoscopic and nanoscale. In particular, his research focuses on the effects of correlations in quantum antibody systems, such as qubits coupled to photonic waveguides and quantum dots in dissipative environments. Uh, and Professor Berenger is here in Natal for the workshop on finite uh, systems in non-equilibrium. So I would like to also thank the organizers of the workshop for helping us with uh, this colloquium. Uh, and for those of you who, 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 have, who are not attending the workshop, I encourage you to have a look at the program and par participate in the talks. So this is go going to go on until the end of this week. And without further ado, let me hand it over to uh, Professor Harold Berenger. Uh, he will speak about nonlinear IV curve at the quantum critical point and uh, quantum noise. Well, thank you. Thank you, Rodrigo, and uh, also thanks to the, to the organizers of both the colloquium and the workshop uh, for this opportunity to speak. So let me start by just, uh, um, I've, I've started just by listing here a number of the themes that I'm going to be discussing. So I come from a nanoscale physics and quantum transport background. So in terms of specific uh, s physical systems, I'll be talking about nanostructures, uh, quantum coherence and quantum fluctuation, an example of which is shown here, which we'll be talking about later. And uh, the advantage of this system is that there's really excellent uh, experimental control so that the phenomena can be studied um, in detail. Quantum phase transitions will play an important role in, in my story. So I just want to remind you that a quantum phase transition is an abrupt change in the ground state of a system upon changing some parameter. And at the point of the transition, at the critical point, you have a competition between the two possible ground states, which gives rise often to interesting many-body correlations. Now, one usually thinks about phase transitions in terms of, of bulk systems, um, but in a, there, there's also the possibility of having um, uh, a phase transition involving uh, boundary degrees of freedom. So in classical transitions, this would have to do with, say, the free energy of, of surface terms. And in my case, we'll be talking about boundary quantum phase transitions, and we'll be talking about a, a non-Fermi liquid critical state at the transition. Um, these interesting states are, are sort of intrinsically connected to the, uh, the, the quantum noise, the quantum fluctuations of the environment. Um, and then finally, the last theme, uh, somewhat towards the end of the talk, we'll be talking about non-equilibrium phenomena. And in my case, that means uh, non-equilibrium steady states or the current voltage um, curve um, very concretely. OK, so let's start. Let's see. Doesn't advance. We tested it before. Hmm? Yeah. So, uh, so let me start with uh, talking about quantum mechanics and the environment. And of course, this question of you know what happens when a quantum system is open to the environment has been asked you know practically since the invention of quantum mechanics. And the answer, actually, um, is that decoherence happens. That uh, you get a suppression of quantum effects. And we're familiar this, with this from a number of phenomena. For instance, in, uh, in NMR, one talks about the T1 and T2 times. T1 is for the energy relaxation of the spin. T2 is for the dephasing because you're between the different spins in the ensemble. Very similarly, in a kind of uh, more contemporary context, one talks about the same kinds of phenomena for qubits. Um, open quantum systems uh, in which one considers a, a master equation in which there's, there's basically a stochastic term um, have been receiving a lot of attention. And one of the contexts which has been kind of providing impetus for all this is, uh, is the field of quantum information 
in which case one really wants to try and protect the quantum information you know, from the environment. And one can do that in various ways. There's a lot of work on using topology, various kinds of symmetry, what we call decoherence-free subspaces, as well as, uh, well as error correction. Now here, uh, my discussion of, of the effect of quantum fluctuations is going to be in contrast to this. Here in this work, we're using the quantum fluctuations of the environmental bath to create interesting states. That is, we have quantum many-body states which are produced by the dissipation rather than destroyed by it. Let's see if this doesn't work from this side, I guess. Here we go. So, um, now, quantum, the, the discussion of quantum mechanics and the environment, you know, has has kind of come in waves over the years. And I just wanted to talk about a, a couple of the, of the high points. So there was this very important idea uh, back in the 60s of modeling the environment as a collection of oscillators, basically a bosonic bath. And the point there is that instead of looking into the sort of the microscopic aspects of the particular system uh, that, uh, that we're studying, um, we're going to instead use a kind of uh, a generic, um, nice and, and easy uh, 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 way of describing the environment, and one which captures the main effects, but which we can um, treat um, more easily. So in the 80s, there was a lot of work on this uh, question, uh, largely uh, triggered by this uh, important work by Caldera and Leggett on connection of macroscopic uh, coordinates to, uh, to oscillators. And also the spin boson model emerged as a particularly um, important uh, system. So let's consider a case of quantum tunneling, sort of a two-well system, which the particle can be on the left or the right. And uh, of course, because of quantum tunneling, there'll be a splitting into a symmetric and an anti-symmetric state. Now, suppose my, my particle there is connected to some oscillators such that when the uh, particle, say, is on the, on the uh, left-hand side, the oscillators have to be compressed. When it's on the right-hand side, the oscillators have to be extended. And so as the particle tunnels back and forth, I'm continually sort of compressing and extending these oscillators. If the coupling between the particle and the oscillators gets to be strong enough, then a quantum phase transition happens that is, uh, mostly, well, so largely caused by the fact that the oscillator wave functions uh, become orthogonal to each other. And the state, instead of having this, um, you know, having a single ground state, now has a ground state with two um, degenerate states. And the particle is localized in, in one of the wells. Okay. Now, this, since I'll be talking about quantum transport, this is a, an important um, example uh, that was studied just a little bit later called the environmental Coulomb blockade. So <coughs> consider a particle tunneling through a barrier. So this is meant to be a metal. This is the Fermi energy. I have an electron coming along through this barrier. The electron uh, goes through. And <coughs> when it goes through, um, the... Uh, uh, at first, when it goes through, of course, the, the electron is, is localized, the bare electron tunnels. However, the charge of that electron immediately starts getting screened by the electrons in the metal, and so the charge starts to flow out to the boundary. Right? And in a good metal, this happens very, very quickly, basically the speed of light. Right? And so you don't think about it, and, um, and tunneling happens very easily. But Suppose I have a metal in which that spreading of the charge is, is, is uh, impeded. Oh, here we go. Um, so that uh, the spreading of the charge is slow. And then when that, if that is happening, uh, as the electron is uh, remaining close to the barrier, its Coulomb interaction will suppress, will prevent another electron from tunneling. So this was studied, and um, the, uh, the observable you could look at, for instance, is the differential conductance. Uh, and the one found that the, that the conductance varied as a power law in the applied voltage. So the response is 
not linear, we don't have linear response, and where that power is related to the resistance of the leads in these natural units. So E squared over H is a natural unit of conductance. So this is a dimensionless, uh, um, it's a dimensionless uh, number uh, which, which appears in the power here. Okay. So we're going to be, I'm going to be talking about uh, tunneling through two barriers, so resonant tunneling. So here's my situation, and I just want to remind you of the double barrier um, tunneling formula. It's a Lorentzian in which there's three parameters. There's the detuning of the level from the, um, from the energy you're considering, in our case, from the chemical potential. And then there's the coupling of the level to the left and to the right, in other words, to the source and to the drain here. And if I have symmetric coupling and I'm exactly tuned to resonance, then the transmission is equal to 1. And the transmission is related to the conductance through the system simply by multiplying by e squared over h. That's this Landauer viewpoint. And our question then is what happens when we uh, connect an environment? Okay, so first I'm going to tell you about the experiment um, done in a carbon nanotube. So I'll explain that to you. And then we'll do some basic, uh, the basic understanding of what's going to, of, of what's happening involves, first I have to explain how the quantum dot couples to the environment, what this environment is. And once I've done that, you'll see that I can map that model into a one-dimensional interacting model known as a Luttinger liquid, um, about which an enormous amount is known. And I'll draw on those results then to find what the temperature dependence should be and compare to experiments. After, after that, we'll turn to the nonlinear uh, IV curve. Uh, and the, the main key here is that we need an effective Hamiltonian at the strong coupling fixed point. Uh, and we can use that to get the IV curve. And then the fourth part, which I probably won't have time for, but I wanted to put it up because it's a, it's a a second example, also using quantum dots and so on, but a different example of, of how an environment can um, act to create interesting states. So I just wanted, wanted to make the point that, uh, that there's more than one um, example. Here's the experiment. So this is done in the group of my colleague, Greg Gleb Finkelstein at Duke. And this is an AFM uh, of their sample. This is a carbon nanotube right here. It's on an insulating sample, uh, insulating a substrate. And these five pieces uh, here are, are metals. So there's electrical contact to the source and the drain. So we're looking at the current through the system like so. And these three are called gates. That means that there's no current flowing through them. The electrons do not hop or, or tunnel from the carbon nanotube to these pieces of metal. These are just there to change the um, electrostatic environment, and in particular to tune the parameters of my double barrier. Here's an example of the data, and you can see, so this is the conductance as a function of two of these gate voltage, and, and you can see it's mostly black, meaning that the electrons do not flow, um, and that's because of the Coulomb blockade. Remember, this is a very small piece of material. This is 300 nanometers here. And when you put an electron on it, there's a charging energy, just E squared over C. And uh, most of the time, that charging energy blocks the uh, current through the system. However, if, you, if the gate voltages are tuned such that the energy for having n electrons and the energy for having n plus 1 electrons is exactly the same, um, neither, uh, yeah, um, then I can get tunneling through the system by just passing an electron uh, through like that. So that's what you're seeing here. These are called the Coulomb blockade peaks. And the conductance on the peak, you see, can be small, or it can go all the way up to E squared over H, indicating that there they have tuned the system to be in the symmetric um, configuration. Here's the, the basic data. Um, so this is the conductance as a function of gate voltage. So we're looking at one of these Coulomb blockade peaks. This is in the case of the asymmetric barriers. As the temperature is lowered, the conductance goes to zero. Okay? 
So that's kind of what one expects. As, as the temperature is lowered, you're basically, uh, you have less energy, the electrons have less energy available, so the effect of the environment will be stronger and stronger. The environment um, hampers the quantum tunneling and the conductance goes to zero. That's kind of the expected result. But look on the left at what happens in the symmetric case. In the symmetric case, um, you can see that when I'm off resonance, the conductance goes down. But when I'm exactly at resonance, the conductance actually goes up. And it goes up to e squared over h. Um, and so that's a very special point. Right? That's if I'm symmetric and on resonance, I have perfect transmission. And for any other parameter, the conductance goes to zero. So that's our, that's our critical point. That's the point at which we'll have uh, claim an, an interesting um, many, many body state. At least at this point, it's our candidate. Uh, let's look a little more at the, at the shape of, the of one of those peaks. So this is the conductance as a function of gate voltage. So I'm, it's just half of one of those peaks. This is the top, and I'm tuning away like so. Remember the simple quantum mechanical uh, um, formula I said that it should be a Lorentzian so that that power down here should be minus 2, but actually it's minus 3.5. So you can see that the simple double barrier formula certainly does not work. And what's happening is that you start out with a very broad resonance, and as the temperature goes down, it gets renormalized smaller and smaller, but the tails of the resonance have the be get acquired this... Uh, sort of very unusual um, power law dependence. <coughs> Let's look at the approach to perfect conductance a little bit more. So here's the conductance as a function of applied bias. So this is non-equilibrium here. And if you look at the differential conductance as a function of applied bias, what you normally expect to see is something that's flat, right? Your differential conductance, you're supposed to have a linear response regime the differential conductance isn't supposed to vary with applied bias. And indeed, at the higher temperatures, that's what you see. There's this quadratic maximum. But as you go to low temperature, you can see that it looks like you're developing a kind of a cusp, right? There's a, a sort of a peak there. If you look at that more carefully by subtracting out the peak value, so this is 1 minus g as a function of applied bias, or as a function of temperature, so just taking the midpoint here, you can see, this is a log-log plot, that there is a power law decay, right? And it's approximately linear. So that's another um, piece of, uh, of data that we need to explain. Okay, so that's my little summary of the experimental data. So perhaps it's a good place to pause for any questions before I dive into the, into the theoretical model. Any questions? Okay, so here's my sort of theorist's cartoon model of what's going on. I have a source and a drain, a single level. There's some environmental resistance, like so. Uh, and in this modeling, I should say, we're, we're following um, some, some previous work. Um, the, the dot and the leads are, are just standard, not interesting. Here's a single fermion for the, for the dot. The leads are non-interacting fermions, just a Fermi C. Um, and the environment, as I mentioned, is uh, simply a collection of, of, of harmonic oscillators. So all of the action is in the, is in the tunneling Hamiltonian. Um, and uh, in order to describe the, the connection between the electron that's tunneling and the environment, I have to know what the electrical properties of the source and the drain are. Right? In addition to being a tunneling barrier for the electron, I also want to think of them as a capacitor right? that, can, that can store charge. And um, I, I need to treat that capacitor in a quantum mechanical way in order that it be influenced by the, uh, uh, and influence the fluctuations of the electromagnetic environment. So that's what I do. I introduce an operator Q, which is the, uh, the charge fluctuations of each of these capacitors. There's a conjugate variable phi, which is the phase fluctuations. And that phi is related to the voltage fluctuations on the capacitor. 
And then you remember that if I uh, exponentiate an operator, it corresponds, it's a generator of translation, of, or, yeah, uh, in its, in its uh, conjugate, right? So e to the i phi will, will increment the charge on the capacitor by one, and then it's clear what the tunneling Hamiltonian has to be. If I destroy an electron in the dot, I'm going to create an electron in the source lead, and at the same time, I'm going to shift the charge on that capacitor, and likewise for the, for, for the drain. The voltage bias goes in uh, in the usual way, so we apply a, a bias between the source and the drain like so. Um, for, for technical reasons, it'll be interesting, it'll be useful to also write the voltage bias onto the tunneling Hamiltonian, uh, and one does that by a time-dependent gauge transformation. Physically, you think about it this way, that is, I, I, as the electron hops from the dot, uh, no, from the source into the dot, there's a, there's a potential drop. Right? In this system, I have, weak, I have weak tunneling, Vs and Vd are small, right? and so the potential is dropping there, and when an electron hops across, it has to acquire extra energy corresponding to that potential drop. And that's exactly what this does, right? I have an extra energy, e to the iet, here in the, uh, in the phase factor, which corresponds, which takes care of, of that applied voltage. Notice that I've used there that I am actually, that that, that is actually where the, where the voltage does drop. Okay, so it's useful to uh, form the sum and the difference variables of this phase, and that's because it's this difference variable which moves charge around the current, uh, around the circuit, right? This difference corresponds to moving an electron like so, and so the charge has to spread out here, the electron charge, the hole left behind, that charge has to spread out here, and so I get a current going around the whole system. That means that, that it's that variable which sees the electromagnetic environment. The sum variable um, does not. So we, as I said, we, oops. We model the uh, resistor as a collection of, uh, of uh, harmonic oscillators. The uh, impedance and the capacitance of the oscillators are chosen such that the impedance here between these two dots is the same as for the resistor. Our harmonic oscillators have the convenient, are convenient because I can integrate them out, and uh, the, the quantity that's going to be important is this correlation function. That is, the time decay of the fluctuations of the charge moving around the circuit, because that's what, that's what this operator generates. And that uh, when you integrate them out is a power law, uh, and the power that goes in there is the environmental resistance, my circuit, divided by the quantum of resistance, h over e squared. Now, um, the uh, next point is that this environmental phase induces, if you like, an interaction in the leads. And the idea is that I want to combine somehow my description of the leads with the environmental phase to have a, a single combined quantity. And the way to do that is to bosonize the leads, bosonize the electrons in the leads. And this is, this is possible in, in, in one dimension. It's, it's known uh, really how to do that, um, you know, absolutely exactly in, in one dimension. Ah, but you say, I don't have one dimension here. I showed you the sample, right? There's this piece of metal, and it w the, the metal was surely bigger than the Fermi wavelength. Surely the Fermi wavelength in the metal, remember, is of order of the atomic spacing, and those wires, even though they were thin, were not atomically thin wires. So I'm not, you know, I do not have a one-dimensional uh, lead, so how can I do this? And the point is that it's an impurity problem, so I'm starting from a single state, say the dot, if I apply a Hamiltonian to it, I get, another s I get a state in the lead. I apply the Hamiltonian to it, I get another state in the lead, which I can orthogonalize. And in that way, I can construct a chain. I can uh, construct an effective one-dimensional um, lead, which I can then bosonize. 
This is true if the, if the, uh, if the electrons in the leads are not interacting. Well, that's, that's an assumption that I'm making. It's, a, it's an approximation. In fact, there is a residual interaction. And to the extent that that residual interaction is important, um, this, uh, this would have to be uh, rethought. OK, so now I have uh, my uh, bosonic fields describing my leads. If I form the sum and difference field, you'll see that the difference field, what I call F for flavor, appears in exactly the same way as the, uh, as the phase from the environment. So I may as well combine them together and I get an interacting field. I get an interacting field. This one is a free, characterizing a free fermion, but this one has these funny characteristics. Remember that power law decay connected to the environment. And together, they form an interacting um, Bose field with an interaction parameter like so. So, here we go. I, I've, I've mapped my problem then onto a one-dimensional interacting field theory, which can be written this way. I've, I've chosen to put all of the interacting stuff on the boundary. Um, this is the tunneling term. Uh, destroy the dot, destroy an electron in the dot. This is what's created. And the fact that this, uh, I have this G here, which is not equal to, to 1, is a sign of the interaction. Now, this isn't exactly a Luttinger liquid, because in a Luttinger liquid, the, both of the lead fields would have the same interaction parameter. Well, in this case, the, this uh, total charge field is non-interacting. Well, this one is interacting. Nevertheless, I can draw on all, all of the previous work that's been done on one-dimensional interacting systems. And in particular, we can perform a perturbative RG, so when the couplings v, Vs and Vd are very, very weak. Um, but in addition, a great deal is known about the strong coupling fixed point. And here we were, it's a simple enough system that um, and in particular the, the conformal field theory methods that were employed by Eggert and Affleck can tell you uh, an awful lot about it. So here's the resulting uh, renormalization flow. So uh, we start down here at very small uh, Vs and Vd. And if I'm not tuned to the diagonal, I end up at one of these two corners. And what this means is that uh, one of the barriers, the, the barrier which is larger to begin with, grows to infinity so that the system is completely cut, and the other barrier goes to zero, so that this fixed point, the ground state at this fixed point, is a cut wire uh, to semi-infinite Luttinger liquids. On the other hand, if I'm exactly on the diagonal, uh, oh, in, in that cut wire, the dot has been completely incorporated into, into one of the leads. I've kind of lost its identity. If you, if you flow along the diagonal, you have a kind of frustration, right? The, the dot uh, is uh, trying, or the leads are trying to grab the dot for itself, the dot being incorporated into the source or into the drain lead. Um, but uh, there's a competition between the two, and as a result, you end up at a fixed point in which actually uh, both barriers have gone to zero, the system is completely translationally invariant, and the conductance is equal to one. This competition between two possibilities um, is actually what makes this fixed point very much like the two-channel condo um, fixed point, if, you, if you're familiar with that literature. Okay, so what do I do now? Well, <coughs> uh, the, the approach to those fixed points will be controlled by the scaling dimension of the, of the operators around them. And because so much is known about them, I know what these operators are. Physically, the most important effect on transmission is 2KF backscattering, right? An electron comes in, at the Fermi momentum going like that, it goes out at the Fermi momentum like so, and that's the biggest effect on the current. Right? So that operator in bosonized form looks like this. It's a cosine times one of the phases. And you can, from the scaling dimension, you get a prediction for what the conductance should do. 
Now, if I'm tuned to resonance and symmetry so that the coefficient of that operator is exactly zero, then I need to go to the next operator, which has this form, and a corresponding um, prediction for what the conductance should do. Here's the comparison to experiment. So the experimentalists can measure four power laws, okay? And they use one of the power laws to extract the parameter r. So uh, the peak height uh, in, the, in the asymmetric case, in the asymmetric barrier case, the peak height is a function of temperature, is this green line here. And you can see it's a nice power law which, from which they extract r equals 0 0.75. And then we compare. The, in the symmetric case, remember the, con the conductance peak got narrower and narrower and narrower. And that width decays as a power law, the black line here. Measured as 0 0.45, Luttinger liquid says it should be 0 0.43. This is the approach to perfect conductance, 1 minus g. Uh, the ex remember, the experimentalist, experimental observation was an approximately linear approach, and that's the Luttinger liquid. And finally, there is this peculiar tail of the, um, of the, cool of the, uh, of the peak, uh, the fact that it was not Lorentzian, and the measured value is 3.4, and the um, Lundger liquid gives 3.5. So excellent agreement on these uh, power laws. You can imagine that we were really delighted when we, when we got this result. Okay, so before I go to non-equilibrium, perhaps I'll pause here for any questions. Okay. Okay, so... First, just a few you know, general remarks about non-equilibrium many bodies. So um, you know, non-equilibrium systems have been um, intensively studied for, for a long time. You know, at, at, at my university, there's a center for nonlinear and complex systems, uh, and they do all kinds of interesting problems, but it's all h bar equals zero physics. It's all classical. And indeed, uh, the, the large, large majority of work in non-equilibrium dynamics has been in classical um, systems. However, um, non-equilibrium physics in uh, quantum mechanical systems and quantum, quantum many-body systems has been growing very rapidly. Um, that's one of the reasons for the workshop here this week. Has been growing very rapidly, and there's uh, a number of, uh, of different settings um, where, where that appears. Uh, one, for instance, would be the dynamics after what's called a quantum quench. So in a quantum quench, you prepare your system in, a, in, a, in an excited state or in the ground state of some Hamiltonian, and then you suddenly change the Hamiltonian. And that can either be a local change or a global change, and you see what happens um, to the system. There's been a lot of interest in periodic driving. When you have periodic driving, you have what's called Floquet states, states which are, which are periodic in time. And their properties, for instance, their topological properties have been of, uh, of, great, of great interest. Um, my own connection here, as I mentioned at the beginning, is through non-equilibrium steady states. And in this case, uh, you know, there is no time dependence. Um, there's possibilities of various kinds of driven and transitions in the setting of quantum transport, it's natural to look at the, at the current voltage um, characteristic. And I would argue that, that this system that we have here is particularly good. Um, first of all, there is this interesting many-body physics. Uh, that's kind of the, um, the first thing you need to have. And we have this boundary quantum phase transition of the two-channel condo type with this state which has all these you know, funny power laws um, as, you, as you approach the strong coupling fixed point. There's the experiment, um, and you'll see in a minute that we can get some analytic results for the non-equilibrium, for the, for the IV curve. Okay, so now, first of all, of course, <laughs> the non-equilibrium aspect is not a problem experimentally, right? <laughs> They, they uh, just turn up their, uh, their applied current and they get the IV curve, no problem. So that's been measured. Um, for us, the theorists, it's a problem because uh, what, what we need to have, if, 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 we, if we want kind of the full IV curve, we need to know the behavior, not just the scaling behavior, 
not just that, that power law as I approach the various fixed points, but more about what happens along the whole line. So how it crosses over, say, from this fixed point to that one, or from this fixed point to that one. And in order to describe the crossovers having to do with a strong coupling fixed point, I need to know more about it. So I need an effective model of what's really happening at that, um, at that fixed point. And so I'm not going to present sort of the, the details of that, but I want to point out two key ingredients which, um, which go into it. So the first one is to say that we know, if I start with these large barriers, we know from the weak coupling RG that the barriers are going to get smaller and smaller, and the system is going to flow to a translationally invariant system. So to capture that last part of the crossover, what we do then is introduce a model in which instead of large barriers, I have very small barriers. So imagine this is the potential in my, in my wire. Here's the Fermi energy. And I have two little tiny potential barriers uh, separating my dot. And so, th so this, is a, this is an important ingredient. We would argue that the way that this approaches that strong coupling fixed point is the same as the way that our original problem um, approaches it. That's kind of a universality um, argument in there. And secondly, uh, we have to remember the, the landauer boudicca approach to quantum transport, um, which is as follows. So they say is, you know, I should fill my, my right moving states, so the states which come from the, um, from the source, I'll fill them to some chemical potential, and I'll fill my left moving states to another chemical potential, like so, right? So coming in like this. Now, if you have a strong barrier in between, what that means is that all of the states in the source are basically filled to this chemical potential. All of the states in the drain are filled to that chemical potential. And you have the voltage drop in between them. But if the barrier is very small, that's not the case, right? If the barrier is very small, you have all of the right-going states filled to the source and all of the left-going states filled to the, filled to the drain, and the voltage bias drops between the right-going and the left-going states throughout the whole system. And this potential, this, uh, these potential barriers here, we'll call the weak backscattering as an electron coming in here gets backscattered and goes back. So with that, we get the following um, effective Hamiltonian. So there's, the, there's a free field that's associated with the phase at the beginning, which just wasn't coupled to the environment. There's my interacting field. That's the, um, you know, the phase that is uh, coupled to the environment. And um, this is the backscattering term. So remember, I, I had pointed out that this cosine of the phase corresponds to, corresponds to backscattering. Here we have coupled backscattering of both of the, of both of the particles. And in addition, um, the gate voltage, if I'm detuning from uh, exactly on resonance, the gate voltage is going to somehow fix the mean occupation of the dot. So that's what gives rise to this term. Theta f is basically the, um, the, the uh, number of electrons um, in, in the dot. Notice how the bias voltage comes in. It's in this backscattering that uh, an electron acquires an additional energy, EV, because of the difference in chemical potentials between right-going and left-going. And so the EVT goes right in there. That's where the bias goes. Now, V gate is equal to 0. We're on resonance. And the RG yields A goes to 0, so I flow into 1, 1. If V gate is not equal to 0, I'm off resonance. This freezes somehow to the mean value so that this becomes a C number. And the operator is this one, which is relevant and grows. And this then controls the flow away from 1, 1 to 0, 1. Um, so let's look on resonance first. So the goal is to find the current as a function of voltage bias, the leading order in A, and all orders in the field. And I'm just going to do a golden rule calculation of this backscattering. So I'll have perfect transmission, and then that perfect transmission will be corrected by this golden rule um, um, result. And um, the golden rule result uh, 
is just tunneling in the presence of, a, of an environment. So we know the result. Here it is. Again, this is for approaching 1, 1. There's the perfect conductance and then a correction proportional to A squared. Don't worry about the, uh, about the actual form there. So let's see how it works. <coughs> so this is uh, what we're plotting here is the ratio so of 1 minus G, the correction, at some applied um, bias you know, divided by what it is at 0. And I'm plotting that because then the, that one parameter that I don't know cancels out, right? A squared numerator and denominator cancel. And so this is going to be a comparison with no free parameters. There's no fit. So that quantity is plotted on a log-log scale as a, as a function of the bias. The data are the, are, the, um, are the points. And the calculation I just outlined to you is the red line. And you can see the beautiful agreement as it goes right through the data, like so. And the black curve, don't worry about it. It's an approximate um, uh, uh, treatment, which, uh, which I'm not going to talk about. Now, you, you should be skeptical and ask me, you know, what's really new here? Right? I already told you what the, what the power laws were, just from the scaling dimensions. So this, the slope of this line was known previously, by the previous argument, right? And uh, what's new then is the fact that you get the magnitude right and this whole crossover region um, correctly. So that's one of the crossovers. Let's go on to the, um, to the other crossover. So this will be the crossover uh, towards a away from the strong coupling fixed point. So that has to do with this interesting shape of the, um, of the conductance as a function of the gate voltage. So as a I'm moving the level past the chemical potential, and I'm seeing what the, what the shape of that conductance piece is like. So the equilibrium shape is shown in blue, and the non if I apply a large bias, it's shown in, in red. Now, notice that in the tail, they agree with each other, okay, as they must because uh, we know from our arguments about the scaling dimensions of the operators that, ah, well, that the argument is that, that if I have any sort of typical energy scale, then the scaling dimension should give the behavior as a function of that energy scale. So when it's temperature, it should be uh, that power law as a function of temperature. And when the bias is cutting things off, then it should be that uh, power law as a function of bias. And that is indeed what is seen. However, look in the middle. In the crossover region, they are quite different from each other. And we can explain that. We can explain that with our theory. So um, remember that the operator, which is taking me away from the, from the strong coupling point, had this kind of form. Um, and this is you know, a sign, and I have a one-dimensional field theory then with a sign on the boundary, and that's a, that's a well-known problem known as the boundary sign Gordon model. And so, again, we've mapped the system into a problem that's known, and the non-equilibrium transport has been solved uh, first quite some time ago by Zermelajkov and Zermelajkov, and then uh, uh, Additionally, with some additional information in 1995. Now, they give results as uh, a power series, infinite power series, um, and which we can uh, sum and plot. And here's the comparison. So the equilibrium uh, curve is in blue. The theory is the, is the line. The experiment are the, are the dots. And you can see uh, excellent, um, excellent agreement. In the non-equilibrium case, the, the, two, um, the two theoretical curves don't quite meet. There's a power series expansion from this side and a power series expansion from that side. But they come pretty close, and the data certainly goes very nicely um, from one to another. I should say that in, in this plot, there is a single fitting parameter for, um, for, both, for both cases. Okay. In terms of 
why one gets the, uh, the different behavior in these two cases, you can, you can make an argument in the following way. That is, I mean, both of these happen, you can see, when the gate voltage is kind of of order of the field that's causing the crossover, either the temperature or the, um, or the applied bias. And so if you look at such a case, for instance, in the, in the temperature case, so applied bias equal to zero, what you'll see is that you know, the, the distribution of the particles is quite broad, right? And in particular, um, there's uh, sort of the, the distribution of par the, there's the possibility of actually having some um, excitation or some, some tunneling um, into the lead. The distribution of the particles will be you know, given by the derivative of the Fermi function. Um, in contrast, at t equals zero, the distribution of the particles is, you know, a square function. It's either, there are either particles there or not. So there's a very abrupt cutoff. And that explains then why the, um, why in the voltage, why in the non-equilibrium case, the turnover here is sharper than in the equilibrium one. Okay, so I come to the, to the fourth part of the, of the talk. Um, which is a work done with Gu Zhang and Eduardo Nevaez um, here, in, here in Brazil. Um, so, and as I said, I included that, I included it just to, to make the point that this one case that I've been talking about, sort of the resonant double barrier problem, is not the only case where one can use sort of quantum fluctuations of the environment to make interesting states. And in this case, we had two, uh, two quantum dots uh, in which there's an interesting um, intermediate fixed point, uh, the two impurity condo model, and which was uh, not, uh, one could not observe in the experiment because of charge transfer indicated here. And after we know how to get rid of charge transfer, right? You would attach your electromagnetic environment and kill the charge transfer and thereby restore or the possibility, or establish the possibility of seeing that intermediate fixed point um, experimentally. But I don't think I'll go through that story. Rather, I'll come to my conclusions. So uh, I've been talking about the connection to the environment, quantum noise, and making the point that it causes and enhances um, quantum critical states. Uh, so but the first sort of general thing I want to say is that you know, this is a wonderful system, this business of having these quantum dots, particularly the carbon nanotube quantum dots. Yeah, this is a different structure. Again, you see the, the carbon nanotube quantum dot and the leads to the source in the drain and the gates here which are used to tune the parameters. Uh, because uh, we, we, can, we analyze it using 1D physics, uh, using a lot of known known results in this in this new context and in particular it allows us to get these non-equilibrium effects the nonlinear IV curve near the quantum critical point um, and uh, compare that with experiments so let me close by just uh, thanking thanking the team so I have uh, three students that have worked on this Gu Zheng, Dong Liu, Hua Zhu Zheng three foreign um, collaborators Eduardo Nevaez Chengu Chung in Taiwan, and Serge Florent in Grenoble. And of course, we are deeply indebted to the experimental group of uh, Gleb Finkelstein and to the Department of Energy for funding. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs>